as Ali said, I was here in the early 90s, mid 90s, uh, looking at Tacoma and a number of other cities for an NSF grant that we, uh, Gary Gale and I had, um, also an Economic Development Administration grant, really focused on the question of what happens when the rug is essentially pulled out of local government, when the federal funds started to move away and decline, any kind of help that local governments had was really kind of cut off during the Reagan administration. And that's actually when I left HUD, <laughs> because there was nothing left to do. But we looked at, we did a uh, quantitative analysis, and then we paired that with case studies in 13 different cities. So the cities range from Tulsa, Oklahoma, to Macon, Georgia, to Cleveland, Ohio, and Tacoma. And the book featured four of those case studies. It featured Syracuse and Tacoma in a chapter that Ali referenced called Cities with a Different Path. Because our argument was that when you had to rely on your own funds, which is what happened after the rug was pulled out of under cities, you could just become a caretaker government again and kind of go back to just doing potholes and police and fire and public health if you did that. Um, but a lot of cities recognized that they didn't have that choice. So there's a global economy emerging. This is really the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s. There's a global economy emerging. Cities felt they had to compete not only with Seattle or Federal Way or LA, but they had to compete on this global stage. So cities kind of went on their own and tried out the various entrepreneurial strategies that we recognize today. So two of the uh, chapters, two of the book's uh, chapters, focus on the cities that did kind of really interesting and unexpected entrepreneurial activity. Some of them even went as far as becoming equity investors, which is what I understand the university is now doing in Tacoma. Um, but city governments putting city money on the line to do equity investing was something kind of unusual. So we featured what we were interested in, especially as the equity, I'm sorry, the equity investment, the entrepreneurial strategies. But the Tacoma chapter was different, and it re referred to a different path. And our argument was comparing Syracuse, the other city in this chapter, and Tacoma. And Syracuse had kind of a bureaucratic structure, northeast city, they like big government, they have big government, they have really solid institutional structures. And Tacoma, where things, I'm from the west, and so you know things are a little more fluid, we're not so sure about government, the structures of institutional kind of infrastructure in a city is not as solid, it's not as old, not as professionalized in many cases. And we refer to the contrast between the cities as, as Syracuse rather bureaucratic, Tacoma enabling. To get things done, they had to pull things together almost on a project by project basis. It was kind of like the Mickey Rooney movie, you know, let's go build a barn, and we'll do it this time, and then we'll see if we can get the same people together or the other people we need for this next project. And we were really fascinated with this very agile, very flexible, words we weren't even used then, but enabling kind of style of getting things to happen within Tacoma. And Ali was catching me up a little bit, and I would be very optimistic. I'm generally optimistic about cities, but Tacoma really does sound like things are, magical kinds of things are happening here. Um, so I'm, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert because Ali remembers the book even better than I do. Uh, and I haven't had a chance to come back. But I will tell you about Denver, which is a similar kind of city demographically. It's bigger, but it's bound. It's really kind of interesting in terms of some of the parallels. And what I would call enabling then in our chapter, now I would call collaboration. So enabling does have this kind of therapeutic sense, and collaboration is actually it's a word we like to say. It's not an easy word. And so what I'm going to talk about here is the idea about collaborative governance, and Michael suggested this is something that he's working in, so he's going to hopefully fill in the gaps. Um, but the idea of collaborative governance and why it's such a, a, a positive kind of word that's advocated now and why it's so hard to do it. So the argument, what's so hard about collaborative governance, is based on some experiences I've had uh, looking at Denver, but I think generalizable to a certain extent, and I'm interested in what you have to think about and say about this, generalizable to other cities that are trying to think about this new way of moving ahead. And the argument here is that the reason it's so hard to do collaborative governance is the deck is stacked. And I think these are familiar arguments, especially if you're in local government or been in local government. But increasingly, we see more complex, more interdependent problems on local agendas, being asked to do things they weren't asked to do in the past, especially things that are cross-boundary issue, cross-boundary in terms of sectors of public health and education and children's services and maybe environmental. 
and also cross-boundary in the sense that it's not just Tacoma, but it's also Federal Way and, and Auburn and, and some of the surrounding communities. You can't solve the problem within the city limits. So the key to me that makes this really chilling and complex and really interesting and compelling is that no one's in charge. No one organization can solve any of these problems. Even if it looks like it's environmental, you can't do it with invol without involving public health or children's services or the fire department. So to me, that one key factor, the fact that no one can do it on their own, makes cooperation really compelling. And it's really kind of an argument that we should, of course, be doing this. It's so obvious that we need to cooperate. But there's huge, huge, huge disincentives for doing that. The deck really is stacked. And again, this is something we're all familiar with, especially those of us interested in local government or state government. Um, American cities, as we know, are just totally dependent, almost totally dependent, on external investment, revenue that they generate from taxes, on households and on businesses. So they're very vulnerable. Elected officials are dependent on the votes of people within, sometimes in very conscribed and circumscribed neighborhoods within the city. The power and authority, I think, that local officials have just pales. It almost fades away in the face of this kind of tsunami of external forces, demographic changes, immigration coming in, the economic landscape shifting, globalization having an impact. It's very hard to hold local officials responsible for things that they really can't control. And that the national government, to some extent, increasingly state governments, have just taken a hands-off attitude towards. So what I'm interested in here is a situation where we're asking local officials, especially, to do things that no one knows what to do. Uh, no one can do it within any one particular organization. No one can say, and like a CEO, well, you guys do this, and we're going to hold you accountable for it. We hold local officials accountable. It's not clear how it's going to work. And in the meantime, they're competing with their neighbors for this very investment that's so critical to city revenue. They're competing with the next door neighbors for business investment, for jobs, for taxes. They, can, they want the households to move in and pay property taxes in their community, not in the community next door. So there's all sorts of things that weaken, I think, the incentive to cooperate. So my argument is the political risk of cooperation where you have to trust somebody. You have to trust other local officials who are just as beleaguered as you are. You have to trust other local governments who are as desperate as you are for this investment. The political risk of cooperation in the short time horizons of local officials, because they're always up for a re-election, really makes this a tough, tough, tough situation. So I'm actually a big admirer, a big fan of local government because I think they're problem solvers. And they've got the worst problems are always devolved down onto the local agenda. So I'm not surprised, in a way, that we have this need for cooperation. I'm even less surprised when we don't see it. But I think when we're asking people to do something we're not very clear about, the whole idea of collaborative governance is kind of a messy idea. It's kind of a slippery idea. Collaborative is tough enough, and then governance, I'll just say what everybody says, it's not government, because City Hall can't get things done on their own either. It's governance. It's all the groups that have to cooperate and kind of work together to make things happen. It's not a tidy concept. It's, it's more ICA as intergovernmental cooperative arrangements, which would be Tacoma and Federal Way agreeing on a joint service to pick up the garbage. I don't know if that happens, but there's a lot of those kind of service arrangements where you see a contract. That's not so hard. You don't have to trust anybody. You just have a contract. Makes it work. Collaborative governance is more than that. It's more than just a contract to pick up garbage or to kind of keep sewers uh, in good repair. It's less than functional consolidation. That's not asking, thank God, Pierce County and Tacoma to consolidate. I'm not waiting for that to happen. I don't think any of us are really in this room. Uh, it's very unlikely that those things happen in American politics. There's just nothing that, that we kind of really anticipate happening. What it is, and this is the definition I use, and that's not something that's going to tell you what to go out and do, but it's, it's a process in which you have intense interactions, a lot of deliberation. It's not just somebody thinking it up and saying, let's do it this way. It's a lot of deliberation, a lot of agreement on shared strategies and joint implementation. So you can tell the last four words are the real critical ones. And we're going to have things that we all agree are the strategies we're going to use and we're going to agree on how to do it. So 
So I've just argued the deck is stacked. Whoever would expect any of this to happen, much less the kind of the consensual agenda setting and let's all carry it out together and we'll all get along in this kind of kumbaya way. Um, but I have to say, I'm really surprised when I look around that there's a renaissance, I think, and that might be too big of a word, but I think it's a good word. It's a renaissance in place-based, local, I'm interested in the local, community-based, cross-sector local collaboratives. So it's not just a planning department that's on fire and has figured out what to do about downtown or what to do about the waterfront. It's cross-sector local collaboratives that we see in an increasing number of American cities. So they're diverse in terms of design. There's not just one way to do things. There's not a silver bullet out there. They're distinguished by different kinds of values that drive them, different kinds of strategies, and a whole range of different kinds of actors. So there's no one way of doing things. And I think they're layered on top of what already goes on in cities, so that's not necessarily the case that we're adding new layers of government or we're bringing in new actors. They're just kind of a new way of doing things. And what I find interesting as a scholar that not all collaboration is the same. This very diversity I've just described kind of, I hope, for most of you, perks your ears up and say, oh, I wonder if it makes a difference. I wonder if some kind of collaborations are more effective or stronger, more resilient than others. And so my argument, my starting point when I started looking around, is that all the variations we see in terms of strategies and structures are really going to make a difference in terms of the actual efforts that are made. To me, the key, key feature, the key thing I'm interested in is state power. And I'm using state with a little s. I'm, it's not state government. It's just political power. It's just the idea that we just assume, well, then the city or maybe the state or the county, somebody's in charge and it's going to be a government. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think what we're seeing now is a different, a range of different models. So in kind of making this argument, I've kind of, as the French would say, problematized my, uh, my uh, variable of state power because I'm interested in collaborations where that is important, the kind of the more familiar, the more traditional, public-centered, public-centric collaborative, whether it's a city hall or somebody, county level government takes charge. I'm also interested, and I actually got in a lot of trouble because I started out being more interested in this second type. So civil society initiated collaboratives are emerging in a number of American cities. They're being pushed by foundations. They're pushed by the philanthropic community. They're pushed as a way of kind of getting things moving in cities independent of whatever mess or how polarized the political structure might be. And as I said, I got in trouble because I was so, I sounded like I was promoting them initially. <laughs> but I was really kind of curious. But I thought, this is not the way we usually think of things working. So I decided to start out without assuming that the state power is the key. I wanted to figure out how important it is, when is it important, and why is it important. And what I wanted to do is look at that by comparing these two models, the traditional state-centric one, where local officials are kind of the ones out there negotiating, initiating funding, despite all the constraints they have, they're doing the local problem solving with this new wave of society-centered models. And I talk about it as a new wave because I think it's relatively new. It's not that we're not used to civil society doing the work in the city. We're not, we're not surprised that civil society actors are out there making a difference. But I'm gonna start with my bottom uh, quote because this is how I got into it. There's a group coming out of Stanford that, uh, with a famous article by Kanye and Kramer, not Kanye West, West but uh, <laughs> Kanye, K-A-N-I-A, -A, and Kramer, K-R-A-M-E-R, -E Kanye and Kramer, developing this notion of a collective impact framework. And the idea was that you look at networks and you don't look at what everybody's doing or putting in. You look at their agreement that they're responsible and accountable for a collective impact at the end. So, if we were talking about um, children's hunger, then we'd be looking at how many meals this group is serving and how many meals this group is serving, how nutritional they are, what can we say about it. The idea with collective impacts is that we don't actually try to measure everything that every organization is doing. We just, at the end of the day, measure whether children are less hungry and getting more nutrition than they had in the, in the beginning. So as you can see, that's, that doesn't really confine you very much, but it does focus on what's happening. It does focus on the impact in that we've all agreed on certain impacts, so we have to be able to measure what they are. We have to have indicators that we all kind of abide by. How we get there, we don't try to regulate that. We don't even try to specify it. 
we just argue, let's all say at the end of the day, we're going to have children that have better nutrition than they had two years ago. So this collective impact framework is what turned me on to what's, I think, emerging in a number of cities with this kind of, I hate to say it, but kind of like a web or a network of civil society actors. There's not so much emphasis on government or business. They could be there. They often are there. But they're not necessarily in charge. And generally, they're not the ones starting this. So the argument would be less emphasis on government and business, more attention to really pulling all these civil society actors into a more coordinated, problem-oriented network. And this is where foundations come in. So as Ali mentioned, my earlier work, or my work up until now, has I said, well, I think foundations are doing something. And then I just said, well, let's see what happens when they take charge. You know, it seems I'm a political scientist. You know, it's not where I'd look first. But you know, what happens if they're in charge? What, what kind of makes a difference? So we see multiple actors, a lot of cross-sector actors, kind of articulating a broad agenda that they've kind of agreed on. It's kind of a consensual agenda. They mobilize for joint work, and they coordinate their implementation of the problem project-specific activities, which is what they've already done. So what I like about this model, maybe it's just my personality, nobody's trying to change what United Way does. Nobody's trying to change what Feed the Children does. Nobody's trying to change the individual organ organizations. They're trying to move them in the same direction with the idea that the collective impact at the end of the day is going to be better if everybody's doing what they do best at. So I'm really interested in this kind of more comprehensive, and this is my, one of my favorite things. There's actually an emphasis on linking up, not, not really an emphasis on scaling up. So the linking up strategies is kind of realigning what United Way does and just a little bit, just tweaking it enough to get it kind of on the same page um, as other programs. Connecting resources, not building new programs, not really scaling up and trying to create bigger programs. So you can see this has a certain political appeal to it. It's a very apolitical argument in a lot of ways, and this is uh, something I've tried to look at a little bit more carefully. So some of, sometimes the collective impacts framework is a good way to explain this. What I wanted to do is compare these two models at an early stage, That's partly because they're at early stages. I had in Denver, Colorado, which is where I am, and where I do a lot of my work, and I'm writing a book right now on Denver politics. And in Denver, Colorado, they actually have, as I'll, I'll point out, two really intriguing collaboratives going on. One is a traditional state-centric model, state-centered. Not surprising. It's a fast tracks initiative. It's a very complex public sector effort to develop a regional transit system. And it'll maybe blow your mind. It blows my mind when I think about what they've been able to pull off in terms of the cooperation and the trust for a while. Um, and then the Children's Quarter, which is spearheaded by the Piton Foundation, a community base, it's a family foundation in Colorado, uh, to improve children's well-being. So you can see already it's comprehensive, it's a collective improvement in children's well-being in a targeted area. I'll talk about it a little bit. So I'm actually, it's early, I can't really make an argument that one strategy is better than the other, but I am trying to make an argument that one turned out to be more resilient than the other. And I was mentioning I've been betting on the presidential campaign. I'm pretty much losing every bet I've made. So I'll just let you know, I bet initially my expectation was fast tracks is going to be the one that's going to be hard to pull off. Despite the fact that you have a public authority, a transit authority pulling it together, there's all sorts of governance challenges. I mean, it's just nuts to think you're going to get six counties surrounding Denver to cooperate, share taxes, share a really high transaction costs involved in a transit system, trusting each other with hugely different interests. So my argument is if I compare these two, Piton Foundation, Children's Quarter, is going to sail along. They have nothing left to lose. They're not doing anything that's going to threaten their organization. They're all going to look better off at the end of the project. Fast tracks, if anything, we know about government. This is the one, I bet, that would fall apart. So I've already foreshadowed a little bit of what's going to happen. But I'll tell you why I think it happened. Um, Denver's a great place to look because it has this legacy of collaborative initiatives. It's a really, really interesting city. And their argument is because they're a second tier city, and of course they're the biggest city in the state, but they're, I mean, there's nothing around us for hundreds of miles. You know, we've got the Rocky Mountains, so we win all the time. So, but we're really kind of a regional business center, we're a regional finance center. We're really not um, kind of a major player in any of the 
uh, kind of scenarios you might have about uh, American politics. But we do have, because of that, this kind of sense that we've got to work together to make things happen. So the traditional, what I came, I came from Chicago. I grew up in California, but I went to school in North Carolina and taught first in Chicago. And I thought, I can't believe it. They all think that they all are going to get along and business is not fighting it out with city government. They're all kind of working together. And they really had a legacy that I traced back to 1989. And in 1989, they put together what we would probably call a tax sharing agreement, but it's a blueprint. And they wanted to kind of build up the scientific cultural facilities. And they created this tax sharing agreement for all the counties. We're just going to have a limited, time bound, modest, modest, modest sales tax, which is how we fund local government, to support an art museum, to kind of keep the libraries going, to support the cultural facilities we have in the community. And this turned out to be so popular and so effective that they have taken this blueprint and just moved it from one mega project to another. So the Pepsi Center, same blueprint. The Denver Zoo, same blueprint. All the different big projects that involve these cross-boundary cooperation in Denver uses this blueprint. And it's, the voters are kind of used to it. They have this amazing record of supporting almost every bond issue that comes up. And every time they're asked to kind of tax themselves collectively, to get something for the city, they say yes, which I find astounding. Um, so there's a kind of a, a legacy of cooperation. There's a legacy of collaborative initiative, not so much because they're virtuous, but because they have to. They're second tier. They're remote and isolated. They're bounded. It's a, it's a city that's actually bounded by the state legislature during the busing uh, and seg uh, desegregation days. So they're uh, forbidden from annexing. It's like they do have almost a city wall around them. So if they're going to do anything, they've got to get other people to kind of join along. So let me take you to my comparison here of these two initiatives and talk a little bit about what they are. Now, I don't know why. I forgot a map. I should have put a map up here because this would help you get a sense of the scale. But this is a 121-mile system. This would be connecting Seattle and Tacoma and all the areas around here in one transit system and getting them all to the table and keeping them there. And they all sign up. So they all sign up to agree. And the blueprint that I just mentioned was put before the voters in 2004. The voters agreed uh, a 0.4% increase in the sales tax to support fast tracks, the name of this new system. 122 miles <laughs> began at $6.7 billion, fast tracks project. And amazingly enough, this is what I do find remarkable, it began as a locally funded project. They were just going to use this dedicated sales tax to kind of get it going and make it work. They weren't looking to the federal government. It's just going to be kind of a do-it-yourself regional transit system, which I find wonderful. Um, as cost increased, and I'll talk about that a little bit, the federal funding became more critical. And fast track had to become more collaborative because there was a number of crises that were created that occurred that I'm going to mention here. So they brought in more and more people. So the cost is one of the major things to keep in mind, and the equity concerned are another. Now, my description of fast tracks when I'm teaching, um, and students are really amazed at this, because fast tracks goes all over Denver. And then, as I said, it goes into these outline areas, like it would be going up to Seattle and into my area. I live in Boulder. But it wasn't necessarily serving the folks that needed it the most. And so the fast tracks area were serving initially, the first one that was completed went into kind of a middle class community where a lot of government workers lived to the kind of the west of, of Denver. Um, and there were increasing equity concerns about what happens if this, if this works, if we actually get a transit system like this. Because it was put into the neighborhoods in Denver that were persistently poor. These are the neighborhoods, no matter what we did, they never became less poor. Every federal program, they targeted the same neighborhood. I, it's the Tacoma story. It's like Hilltop. Every federal program targets the same neighborhood. Nothing ever changes. You know, there's just nothing that's making a difference. And to be honest, the impacts are, are the money going in is fairly small, so we're not surprised. But in this case, this is the biggest anti-poverty program we've ever tried. That's not how it's presented. But if you look at where the transit stations are, they're in every persistently poor neighborhood in Denver in order to kind of have an effective transit system. So I don't think it was meant to be a, an anti-poverty program, but it turned out to be a potentially important way of changing the composition of that neighborhood. 
No, if I say changing the composition of the neighborhood, another word for that is gentrification. So between 2004 and 2011, and there were kind of rumblings going along during this process, there was growing concern that, my God, this might work, <laughs> you know, our, our own private funded transit system. Uh, it might work, and if it works, then what happens to the neighborhoods, the very neighborhoods we're trying to save, are gonna be overwhelmed. All the people that live there are gonna have to move out because they can't afford it. So you started to see nonprofits in the community, and this is where it's, to me, it's almost like a movie. You know, and suddenly the nonprofits are realizing, gosh, what if this works? What are we gonna do to stabilize those neighborhoods so the people that live in there finally are no longer persistently poor neighborhoods? And they actually have affordable housing, jobs, commercial development near the transit station that actually benefits the neighborhood itself. So the nonprofit groups and some of the foundations in the city and some of the neighborhood associations got together and they did, I mean, they went to the endless, 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 endless public participation meetings for Fast Track. And they actually changed some of the corridors and some of the transit lines, but that wasn't the real key. The design had already actually turned out to be this anti-poverty design. Um, but they organized themselves into a collaborative that went through a couple of different names. The Mile High Connect is the current one, the one that long standing. And they started to push fast tracks. And they said, oh, what are your success indicators? And of course, it's ridership. You know, how many people are on the train? It's all the input stuff. And they said, you know, we've got to have different measures. We've got to have different measures of success. We've got to look at the impact on the neighborhood of the fast track system. So they, they pressured. I think the fast track groups, to the way that they changed their indicators of success. They added on affordable housing. They added on jobs and neighborhoods. They started to add on some of the things we might all think would be a good thing to do with a transit system. So it's not just transit. It's really transit-oriented development in a meaningful way. So this collaborative put together the first transit-oriented development acquisition fund, which is money coming in some of it from the fast track revenue, but money coming in, uh, especially from foundations, but from participating banks in the area, because remember, they're more cooperative than banks often are in most places, and created a fund for affordable housing for 1,000 houses around the transit stations, the 13 different transit stations in Denver. In 2014, this initially Denver transit-oriented development acquisition fund for affordable housing went regional. And so all the transit stations in this whole system now have access to these funds. There's about four different layers of financing with banks at the bottom kind of guaranteeing conventional loans and then foundation funding, making it possible to get below market rates and all sorts of different things. It's a very, very innovative thing. So what we now see is two collaboratives. We have Fast Tracks, traditional state-centric. We have Mile High Connect, who nobody even imagined in 2004 when it started, centering on equitable transit-oriented development. They're really pushing housing, jobs, education, reducing or at least mitigating gentrification. So what I find interesting about this is this was not expected. I mean, these are guys, it's, it's the, the Regional Transit Development Authority. It's a public authority. These are guys that build trains and put tracks in places. I mean, they're not thinking about any of this. And suddenly we have in Denver a different kind of a model. Now, before I get too romantic about it, I want to point out it got really, really expensive really, really quickly because of between 2004 and 2011, when this kind of started to percolate into this more equitable strategy, we had the 2008 recession. And if you're dependent on sales tax, it just kills you. So the revenue coming in for the train line for transit kind of declined. The construction costs were going up in a way that nobody anticipated. And Burlington Northern Santa Fe, who had lines throughout the area, and, and the idea was that we would use their right-of-way and use their railway lines, kind of <laughs> acted like any business would. They started to raise their price. And I have to say, I couldn't believe that the city or the RTD had not negotiated this as part of their contract, you know, that the price of the right-of-way to use the lines was already settled. But it wasn't, and so Burlington Northern was able to kind of you know, jack that up as it went along. And the whole idea, for this, the whole cost of the project went from 894 million up to the 1.7 billion. And the plan to simultaneously build out all 10 transit quarters stalled. Now, why do you think they would want to build 10 transit quarters all at once? I mean, huh? Equity 
the oh yeah, you know, you're just going to get bullshit from every local official in every community. If they're not all seeing their line coming in, it's on its way, you know, they built the first one and that's the next one, whatever. The mayor of Denver, John Hickenlooper at the time, became the governor during this whole process. That's how long this went on. And he was adamant. He said, we, we, they all have to be built simultaneously. We just can't take the, the static we're going to get, you know, if one gets built before the other, because our whole thing is built on this collaboration. And everyone's going to get what they think they paid for. So he really pushed on simultaneously building that out. The only way they could do that with the revenue going down was to pass another bond measure, which nobody really wanted to do, or somehow add in another sales tax. So they're suddenly stalled in uh, 2009, 2010, and have to start to set priorities. So they create a, a queue of which lines are going to be built first, and exactly, as Michael suggesting, exactly what you'd expect to happen starts to happen. So there's a crisis in this collaborative. Some of the communities, like the one where I live, are realizing, We've been paying into this thing for seven years. We've got millions of dollars of tax money, our targeted little sales tax, going into this fund, and we're not going to see anything for it. We're not going to see anything until 2042. It's supposed to be next year. Not going to happen. So the city, the RTD is forced, is forced to set these priorities. The city delays the corridors linking the far out northern suburban areas where I live, Boulder and Longmont, to the transit system. The lines that are completed are pretty much, as I said, to the kind of the denser middle class communities and really slow construction in the really poor suburban areas. Denver's one of those cities where the poor are moving out. They can't afford to be in the city. So exactly what you think, exactly what they were afraid of, you see defection. The northern communities like Boulder and like Mongmont say, hey, 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 taxation without representation. We've been paying money into this. We're not getting what we thought we'd get. Why? We don't understand why you're setting the priorities you're setting. We paid a lot of money into this thing, and we're leaving the collaborative. We're going to pull out. And I don't know exactly how you leave the collaborative, but they said, even better, we're going to put all our money into escrow. We're going to keep paying the taxes, but you're not giving us what we intended and what we thought we were buying for the tax. So we're going to put the money in a fund so people can see that we're doing our share. You're just not coming through. So they set up their own collaborative. They own, um, Metro Alliance, um, and really challenged and kind of really threatened to bring things to a halt. In 2013, the RTD put together a study, and they promised Boulder and Longmont, the two northern, western most communities, a hybrid system. We don't get light rail, but we get really fast buses, which I'm not happy with. <laughs> it's not fast enough for me. Um, and it meant a huge construction going on, and now they're that's a tollway where there used to be a free road and whatever. So we've got hybrid services, buses and some light rail that doesn't come all the way out until 2042 when this is going to be constructed. So things are not going well. It looks like I'm going to win my money. You know, that this, this is the defection that just, how can it hold together? It's too easy to fall apart. There's too many things that can happen. But in the meantime, I want to just turn to the Children's Corridor because they've gotten started up about the same time. Remember, it's the Piton Foundation. They did everything right. They had meetings, endless meetings, for over a year, setting the agenda, deciding on what it's going to be over 200 different organizations. You can imagine this. Uh, over 200 different organizations involved in the meetings. Piton Foundation pulled it together. They based it, if you're familiar, with the Harlem Children's Zone. It's a fabulous model, with fantastic leadership. They wanted to do the same thing in this quarter that goes from the northeast to northwest of the city. It's where most of the Latino, most of the black population is a huge number of children, 50,000 children in poverty. They defined it in terms of criteria having to do with children in poverty, teenage moms, um, reduced, uh, reduced price school lunches. And it was going to be like the Harlem Children's Zone, a kindergarten to college program, where all of these community groups had agreed that they would hang in there for this cohort of kids and support them from kindergarten, where most of them were at this point. They kind of defined that group for 20 years until they got out of college. So change their opportunities in life. So the Piton Foundation is the primary funder. They're the backbone organization. I'm just going to use a little language here. And they set up this consensual agenda. If you can imagine 200 organizations agreeing on at least this is what we all do best. And if we put it all together, this is where we'll end up. They created a, a 
and indicators, they created databases, they had monitoring, they had measurement, everything that people like us love. Um, and then we find out about two years ago that the Piton Foundation has gotten caught up in the fad, I'm calling it a fad, I think it's probably more than that now, of impact investing that's going through the investment community, but especially going through the philanthropic community, which is pressure to show more accountability. And the idea of impact investing is that you don't target an area like this part of Denver. You have a broader territory and you're looking for the kind of investing that's going to generate an income that allows you to help a broader group of people. So it removed any kind of argument for spatial targeting. It also removed and kind of undermined the whole argument for the children's quarter. So I just want to suggest that when I was looking at these, and I'm just about to wrap up and uh, tell you the, what I consider uh, is the best explanation for what happened. Um, when you're looking at resilient collaboration, the, the collective impact folks have argued, well, there's four things that have to be there independent of what kind of model. You know, there's all these different models, but independent of what kind of model, there's four things that just are critical. And these are the soft spots, if you want to think about it that way. This is what has to work in order for these collaboratives to work. And one of them is there has to be some way that the initial kind of agenda formation, agenda creation is something where there's buy-in. And we're not surprised. These are, this is kind of common sense when you think about it. But when you think about it, well, these are the four ways things could fall apart. But there's a shared vision for change. And of course, on the blueprint market model, the fast tracks model, the buy-in was the voters approved it. They said, yeah, we want to see this. Um, for Piton, it was a very costly, very timely, time-consuming process. There has to be intermediary or backbone support organizations. There has to be not city government, but somebody that's kind of mediating all the different interests involved and is kind of the, the backbone of the whole project that kind of makes it move ahead, move forward. Uh, there have to be some kind of strategies for mutually reinforcing activities. That's not a very gracious way to put it, but across political scales, but how do you get people to kind of coordinate without co-opting them? How do you keep them moving in the same direction without taking over anybody? Nobody join up if they thought they were going to be transformed. And then the last one is some kind of integration with a multi-level governance structure. So the general argument in the literature, I think, would say at least these four things have to be in place, and this is where you should look first. So what I found is both collaboratives faced threats on each one of these dimensions, independent of the model. Remember, one's a traditional state model and one's this new way civil society. They both faced threats on every single one of these factors. And remember <laughs> that I'm betting on fast tracks being the one that falls apart. And it looks like they have. You know, the, my communities, the Northwestern communities are putting their money in escrow, threatening to pull out, kind of shaking the boat. They don't, they don't trust RTD, they don't trust the other communities. And what I did was try to compare them along these lines, and I won't go through all of this because I've mentioned most of it, but the coordination strategies are the things I'm going to focus on because I think that in a way, what happened to kind of save the day uh, for fast tracks was something I'm talking about in terms of dynamic scaling, which doesn't say much. Um, but the coordination that you see within the children's quarter was really relying on existing networks and linkages very localized, um, not very sophisticated. So what I'm arguing here, and what I'd like to just kind of see what you think, um, I'm thinking, well, both of these face the problem. So it's not that one's a silver bullet. It's they always go with the state-centered one or always go with the civil society one. They both faced actually really early difficulties, especially in maintaining their shared vision. I mean, Boulder and Lumley say, what vision? <laughs> you know, we're, we've been screwed. You know, we're not even part of the collaborative. Why are you pretending we're even getting what we paid for out of this? And the Children's Corridor, uh, corridor who all agreed in this very democratic kind of process on what their vision was, um, is essentially being held accountable by their backbone organization. So the argument is that the backbone leadership was really subject to a lot of threats. And I'll talk about these a little bit. Um, let me just mention the one with Peton and the impact of investing. Piton is a family foundation, the Geary Community Investment Company, but they can change their mind whenever. And because foundations increasingly are under these accountability pressures, they're moving in the direction of impact investing. They're moving away from uh, the kind of projects where you have things have to work in one particular area. 
Um, and so the Gary Community Investment just kind of said, well, it's not that we're not supporting Children's Quarter. We're just moving towards an impact investment. We care about children throughout the Denver region. We care about all children in Colorado, wherever they may be. And you can imagine how that kind of works out. Um, and we're just not focusing on the Children's Quarter. So what I'm talking about here in my mind is that the collaborative divide crept in for both. So the collaborative divide, especially for to the fast tracks, is you've got kind of a hierarchical situation. We're not surprised that there eventually now is federal money, state money, local money. And then because of the Mile High Connect, this kind of horizontal group that's kind of knitting together everything at the bottom level. Um, and they have to be, there's kind of two different logics. It's a kind of hierarchy and collaboration. And Fast Tracks, I think, figured out what to do about it, and Children's Quarter never did, because they had this kind of family-oriented, civil society-oriented. It's the last thing in the world they think of is to go to Denver City Government or the state of Colorado to make it work. They're about civil society. They're about this conceptual agenda they developed. So what I'm going to suggest here, just as my last couple of points, is RTD was able to kind of survive because of dynamic scaling. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But they scaled up and they scaled down. They scaled up by pulling in state and federal government in terms of funding. They also scaled up by moving in the direction of put, pulling in some global infrastructure firms that meant that the whole decision arena became kind of blurred. It's not clear who's in charge. It's not terms that Boulder's not happy about what they ended up getting. They don't even know who to talk to because the partner doing the construction is based in Australia. So it changes the landscape altogether. And they scaled, scaled down by kind of bringing the uh, Mile High Connect group into the membership. They kind of, they weren't part of RTD, but they became part of the decision group that Fast Tracks was involved in. And it gave them a very kind of granular sense of what's going on at the neighborhood level. The children's quarter really I said, was undermined. It was really kind of not terminated, but narrowed in a way that it was unable to have any kind of impact that they anticipated. All they have now are their shared indicators. So they really declined, and they didn't have any prospect of vertically integrating because of their kind of commitment to being a civil society group. So I don't know. It's bridging the answer. <laughs> you know, it seemed to work here. Um, I actually say RTD created the problem that they hadn't had to scramble around to solve because I tried to pull together so many people and having such an ambitious project. Um, but they actually were able to kind of survive because they were able to pull things together through this kind of vertical strategy. Now, not everybody that tries this is successful, but they were. They actually were very adept at doing this. And there's growing evidence, and this is where I'm maybe less sanguine about foundations and, and philanthropic groups than I might have been earlier. There's just growing evidence that the broad horizontal ties among groups that lack vertical power, like the Children's Quarter, like other groups that have tried regional strategies, kind of independent of any governance structure, are, it's really a weak foundation for building that kind of capacity, that kind of regional capacity. It's very hard to do it without involving some way of government. Now, I hope you're saying, oh, yeah, give me a break. <laughs> you know, bridging and scaling, you know. How am I going to go back to the city council and say, well, this is what you need to be thinking about? And isn't it really all about power, which is what I would have said? Or isn't it really all about money, which is what you're probably thinking too? And I think those are necessary but not sufficient. You know, I think RTD, the Fast Tracks group, they had all the sovereign authority you could want. They had all the taxation power. They could go on the bond market. They had everything. You know, it would seem to be the obvious explanation. And yet, when you look at it, <laughs> they really had all these defection th threats, all these attacks on the legitimacy by a mile high, all these attacks on the transparency as soon as they got into the global construction kind of arena. And there's all sorts of failed regional transportation collaboratives that have these same kinds of powers. So we have to ask why, why and how did they actually persist? So I think that the political and institutional context that gave them the privileges of sovereignty and financial funding power also created some of the difficulties. And funding's not enough. I think it is necessary. But Piton Foundation was putting more money or a comparable amount of money into this children's quarter. And it didn't work, you know, because the funder essentially changed their mind. 
And then fast tracks is hit because the sales tax goes down. So they're all kind of with vulnerable funding sources. So I don't think that money itself is a, enough of an explanation. And I think that RTD had tremendous authority and huge budgetary clout. And they're making money. They're making money again now as of the economy recovering. But they still are dealing with threats to the very stability and the sustainability. The last thing is something that political scientists always mention, but institutional capacity. Just one organization is better organized, has more capacity than the others. These groups had oodles of capacity. They had capacity up the gazoo. I mean, they're staffed by lots of young people that are really very bright, lots of great engineers, people that wanted to work on something this ambitious because of public transit projects in the United States. It just didn't make a difference. They really faltered in the face of the kinds of challenges. So the conclusion that I'm having to make here is against the odds, I think the fast tracks, against my odds, fast tracks actually has continued to survive whereas the children's quarter faltered. And the state center collaborative, not that this is a vote for state center collaborative every time, but in this particular case, the state center collaborative, which invited, it kind of created threats to defection by getting everybody on board and then leaving them at the table and not even meeting all the, the things they promised, proved more able to adapt to the pressures, which is not the way we think about government. You know, it is not what we think about government being good at is adapting to pressure, being flexible, kind of figuring out new ways to kind of redesign the project, responding to Mile High Connect, making it more equitable, thinking of new funding sources. Who knew that you could have a global construction firm building your highways, doing it for less? You know, it was just phenomenal flexibility uh, and ability to respond to these rapidly changing conditions. But in doing so, I think it really highlights some of the political tensions that come in. Uh, to these kind of collaboratives, and particularly the bridging solutions themselves. Remember I said they scaled up, they scaled down, solved the immediate problem, but it created new tensions. And I'll just mention that one of the, the current ones is that there's been a research into this to connect. You know, the, the buses are there. Some people are riding them. But new politicians are coming into office. They're just elected maybe in the last couple of months. And they're looking at this issue, and they say, boy, here's an issue that really got put under the rug. I'm going to make my career on this. So you have suddenly on Boulder and Longmont City Council saying, we're not settling for this. We're not going to satisfy. We're going to push this forward again. So it looked like a resolution that's kind of created the next round of problems because of the um, political dynamics in these cities. So what I'm going to suggest is that I think collaborative governance, um, which I th was thinking I was seeing when I was here long ago in Tacoma, um, the seeds of that, Collaborative governance, I think, is going to be more necessary. I think it's going to be more likely in cities. It's going to be more difficult for all the reasons I've just suggested, especially because we're having to mobilize around issues like sustainability, like family well-being, um, like regional equity. So I think that collaborative governance, in a way, even though I think it's kind of a messy argument, it's really being experimented with at the city level in ways that I find really intriguing and really important. Hope you agree. Thank you so much. Since this is being taped, we have to ask the questions in the mic. So I'm going to go around with questions. Whoever has questions. Thank you very much. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I think I'll prioritize with a kind of a prior to get some background. Sure. Um, what kind? What circumstances do you to, do you attribute for the Denver metropolitan area being willing? You talked about it being a second tier, et cetera, but still, it, it would for for the kinds of practices that you said have happened repeatedly uh -huh. requires that the suburbs see some commonality with uh -huh. the city and residents in the city and are willing to rely on functions and activities that occur that are built in the city. And that they see that they don't have enough, I presume, enough um, scale in any one or even three suburban municipalities mm -hmm. to do some of that of their own. But that mm -hmm. strikes me as somewhat unusual in major mm -hmm. metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is? Do you think that's what happened? Yeah, so the, the, the blueprint that I described was used initially for a set of facilities like the zoo 
and the library and the art museum. Um, and then it was used for sports stadiums. And then it was used for this fast track, which is less of a kind of a fixed facility. In every case, the facility, the location was never announced. They said it was yet to be decided. So they would have a voter approval. And everyone wanted to have a better zoo. Everyone wanted an art museum. Everyone wanted, except me, <laughs> a baseball stadium or a football stadium. Uh, and voters voted on it not knowing where they would be. They all ended up amazingly located in Denver. But the tax base is shared, and so the people that are part of that six county region have the same price that they pay, whereas somebody coming from Oklahoma has to pay more, that kind of thing. So they created that kind of common interest around a facility. I think it's more difficult, maybe that's one of the reasons, I hadn't really thought about that, but maybe that's one of the reasons that the fast tracks has kind of faltered is because it's more open to defection with, it's not just a zoo not working out very well. It's so many different things that couldn't work out because of the spatial nature of it. The process. And the process. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you. Um, really interesting presentation. Generated so many questions for me. I'm not exactly sure which ones to. So just a few quick points to maybe. Sure. Um, a couple of local initiatives that I was reminded of as you were talking about some of the elements. Um, in terms of the, the children's corridor and a private philanthropy making a long-term commitment to an area like that, and one, uh, it reminded me of uh, here in Tacoma, there's the uh, Russell Family Foundation that went through a, a multi-year process to make a decision about a watershed to invest in for 10 years and looked at a bunch of different watersheds, narrowed it down to two, and then ch uh, chose the Puyallup River watershed. Right. And it might be interesting to compare yeah, the children's. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I haven't followed it closely for a while, but there might be some real echoes between some of the things you exactly. talked about with that. Yeah. And then uh, in the collective impact organization um, model, the Puget Sound Partnership is a state agency charged with cleaning up Puget Sound. Uh -huh. Um, it's a state agency, it has no regulatory authority of its own, uh -huh. uh, and they've been around for about 10 years, but recently I've heard them talking about themselves as a collective impact organization, that, that what they can do and what they do do is bring together all these other actors and players in both the public right. and private sector, um, who, and, and they kind of provide the roadmap that you know, collectively would get everybody to the shared outcome of cleaning up Puget Sound. Exactly. So it's kind of an interesting example of, of thinking about the implications of that. And that I, language is in the air. Yeah. You know, I hear it more and more often. Too. Yeah, so do I. And then the, the last thing, for me an interesting observation about the, um, about the two cases that you looked at is, um, and maybe one reason why the fast track process ended up being more resilient than the children's corridor is that while they both looked collaborative on the surface, the fast track one might have been, had more of the elements of a real collaboration uh -huh. in that once people had gotten together, spent all that time and that energy, uh -huh. one of the things we look at before we get involved is are those in authority uh, who would be necessary to implement the results of this collaboration uh -huh. committed to doing that? And uh -huh. in, in the Children's Corridor case, it sounded like the whole thing could fall apart despite 200 people involved. It could all fall apart if the funder decided, you know, I'm interested in something else uh -huh. now. Uh -huh. Whereas in Fast Track, even when, as you described it, several communities became very uninterested in it, they still couldn't unilaterally, they could try to derail it and they could have been successful, but it wasn't as easy for anyone. They all kind of all had anteed in. Right. Right, and it was hard for anyone on their own or even collectively to derail the whole thing. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because I've, I've been going back and forth myself about why one seemed more resilient than the other. And I actually think the children's quarter, I, I just wonder if over time the groups that are committed to doing that have not said that they'll do something they weren't doing before. They'll just say, we're doing what we're going to do. We're going to measure it like this. We're going to keep doing it. It's not totally impossible that in 20 years, actually, you'll see some of the collective impact, even without the Piton Foundation being involved. But they were the backbone organization that was holding things together. They're calling the meetings. They're doing the monitoring. They still do some of the indicators, but they don't provide the leadership. And so in that sense, I think 
because there are 200, actually I should have been clear, 200 organizations, which is even harder. Um, they had 200 organizations that said, this is something we believe in, we believe this is the way to get there. And we're gonna all kind of make sure what we do gets us to move in the same direction. The RTD, in a way, when you think about it, all they had, this blueprint said, oh my God, all the voters in our community voted for this thing, and now we're stuck. You know, Some of our voting money that we could have had in our community is gonna be earmarked for this transit fund. And so it's possible that some of the local leaders really didn't want to see this. You know, There's a metropolitan mayor's group that was pretty active. They kind of signed up. They were vocal about it but, it, it, but I could imagine there was kind of a wavering of sentiment, especially as things started to fall through and not, not really come through as, as promised. So that element of commitment is actually something worth following to you. Thank you for that. So uh, thank you very much. I, it was a great talk. I have a few comments and also a, I have a lot of questions, but I'll, <laughs> I'll narrow. So um, ultimately, I mean, the RTD was um, responsible back to voters and citizens and yeah. taxpayers. So it seems as if you know they they had to figure something out because yeah, right. you know Good point. <laughs> lives yeah. were at stake in terms yeah. of their political future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the case of the Children's Carter, which is kind of really interesting to me, I'm sort of surprised that there was a single funder because these kinds of things generally, especially a family foundation generate, um, they too start to collaborate as funders right. so that there's a broader base and if any one foundation moves um, or shifts gears, yeah. there are others and also usually these days funders are very interested in building the sustainability of an organization so they actually do whatever they can so that the organization is not reliant upon them but finds other sources. So I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious how sophisticated the foundation was or and whether or not they were kind of, you know, at the same simultaneously building the leadership of this collaborative in mm -hmm. spite of its very democratic structure uh, to be able to have a longer yeah. lifespan. Yeah. That's actually thank you for asking that because it's true that they they weren't the only foundation but they were the biggest foundation. So there were like three, maybe four other local foundations. And then Enterprise Community was in there. Um, a couple of them, I think Annie Casey had money involved. So it wasn't that they were the only one, but they were the biggest one in town. And they were the ones, the, they were the backbone, that critical backbone element that made things work on the ground. None of the others could have carried it off, I think. Um, and they have a terrific reputation. I mean, it's one of my, I really, think highly of the Piton Foundation. They have a terrific, terrific reputation and a lot of trust within the community. And once the Gary Community Investment Group that funds the foundation kind of changed their tact, which you're right, the, a number of places are. And I don't know if the other foundations are following this too. I should follow that up. But once they changed their tact and removed their funding and removed their staffing, that's when things started to decline. Now, you know, what's interesting to me is that, you know, the Piton Foundation itself has kind of disappeared. If you went, if you Google this, if anybody wants to Google it right now, you will not go to Piton, Piton Foundation, you'll go to Gary Community Investment. I mean, the websites, <laughs> this is when I first became suspicious, the websites are the same, the board of directors is the same. There's hardly any difference between what used to be a really important autonomous, locally based, Family oriented, family owned, but community foundation. And now this investment company who's making investment like decisions that I think change everything. And I'm some, I used to kind of argue with Clarence Stone about this because I just never had a sense that philanthropies and foundations could really do everything we were hoping they would do, that they would be the saviors and the champions at the local level and that they were pure and would be able to kind of make things work. And to me, this is not that there's any, any corruption or vice or evil or anything going on. It's just the foundation said to save itself in a way, it has to do this other strategy, which means that counting on in local politics, is, as you suggest, it's totally, it's false. I think it's really kind of worrisome to me. Yeah. Dr. Clark, thank you so much. I um, follow your work and admire it, but it's also a really nice time for me to hear this. I've been 
deep into Denver field notes on the Platte Valley Greenway from oh, research okay. that I've done over the last okay. decade or so. And so a lot of this is really resonant with things like people willing to tax themselves or yeah. the nature of collaboration over the years in Denver. Um, I am reminded when you talk about the um, history of tax, taxing structures, multi-jurisdictional, of the Urban Flood Control District that was founded, I think, in 1969 with a state right. statute, which right. is just an amazing um, entity to be able to do flood management and also these recreational trails through the region. Um, the question that I have is about leadership and the kinds of leadership that you saw or see in those two different collaboratives. And again, this is coming from my just kind of wading through these field notes and interviews where I'm writing really about narrative and narrative networks, but something that keeps jumping out at me is the brand of leadership that was required on the Platte Valley Greenway. Um, the person who was most effective there is not the person who was ever mentioned in any uh -huh. of the formal accounts. So it was Mayor Wellington Webb and right. it was his administration or it was Mark Johnson, the designer at Civitas, or it was Bar Chadwick, who's an amazing planner in the city planning department. All, all these people are wonderful and fabulous. But um, Ken Salazar was really a person who, <laughs> behind the scenes, masterminded exactly what you're describing, kind of how do we link this into state government, how do we kind of institutionalize certain backbones and uh -huh. obligations and funding streams so that people are willing to come to the table and continue to work together. Um, so the question I have is kind of a question I've been um, chewing on myself, which is, who are those people and where do they come from mm -hmm. and why do they do what they do when the very basis of their effectiveness seems to be not wanting to take credit for it, like setting other people up to take the credit, mm -hmm. kind of the, you know, yeah. And, and were they there yeah. in this situation or were they lacking? Is that part of the problem? That's a really interesting point because, I mean, just, I'm just thinking while you're talking, I thought, and if they don't take credit for it, then it's, it's not being passed on. Right. You know, it's not being learned by the next generation. Of, this is how you do it, and let's be sure this happens. And I actually have had this similar kinds of concerns. So what, the name, you may have come across the same too, Tom Clark, who is a Metropolitan Economic Development Corporation leader. He's from the business community. He's the one that says, we have to work together because we're nobody's around to help us out. And he's, that's not the sentiment you generally think the business community is going to present. And so. He is somebody that, I think he's probably in his late 70s at this point. I just can't imagine him ever being replaced. And political scientists, if we're talking about, we cannot deal with that. If we, if we can't theorize it, we can't deal with it. You know, and I cannot theorize Tom Clark or any of the people that you mentioned, or Ken Salazar. You know, there's certain kinds of leadership. But I think in Denver, because there's almost a culture now of this cooperation and collaboration, and you're right, there's lots of other good examples. Um, um, in the environmental area especially, which is where a lot of this language is especially appropriate, I think. Um, how do you kind of make that, how do you pass that on? And so the name, I had to dig around for the names too. I was thinking surely somebody came up with this idea or somebody at Mile High Connect. And there's a couple nonprofits that are pretty important and powerful that I know. And I know they had a leadership role, but as the organization, I don't know the people in it that were making it happen. Tom Clark and the Economic Development Corporation pushing the business community and metropolitan mayors organizing, again, but no one mayor in charge. And so I find that really kind of intriguing. And the RTD is even more obscure. So to look at RTD, one of the guys died during the process, one of the general managers. I thought, well, now what happens? Nothing changed. You know, just kept moving along. And so they often are people that are coming in from other regions. And I think that's part, that's important. But they really kind of quickly pick up this, I think, this sense of opportunity in the landscape where there aren't the roadblocks that you would have in Syracuse, for example, where I said it as a stronger institutional structure. And other than the planning department, which is extraordinary in Denver, that's, it's not a very strong institutional structure. But other than that, you can't really identify individuals. It's really kind of through these organizational channels. There's a, I'll just mention this one thing because I'm interested in, Ali mentioned it initially, it's social entrepreneurship. And there's now a group starting out, um, um, it sounds like an oxymoron, but government entrepreneurship. <laughs> and, and bringing in the ideas of social entrepreneurship and problem solving into local government. And they're going to have fellows 
at the local level. And I think they've identified this problem. What do we do with the next generation if they don't have this experience and they don't understand how to get things done? So they're starting a program now actually connected with the business school at Boulder um, and city government to create these fellows within city government that will get seminars, they'll meet with people at the university. It's not as easy as it is here because it's kind of a distance uh, to go. And they'll try, I think what they're doing is trying to make that gap less profound in the long run. But that's a really excellent point because I, you, you all could probably name people in Tacoma, and I can name people from the 1990s that I knew and that I met. Um, but I can't name very many people in Denver who would, as you say, be willing to take credit and could say, without these people, it wouldn't have happened, which is really a kind of interesting. Maybe, I don't know if that's the wave of the future or if that's just a peculiarity. But it's also something I think they consider now a problem that they can't figure out how you have that kind of leadership capacity in a generation that's not, not been brought up in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Clark, yeah. for your presentation. I just uh, I'll preface what I'm saying by uh, I'm a little bit colored because I'm a recovering uh, Tacoma elected official. So, okay. <laughs> um, but many of what you uh, addressed, especially, I always think um, one of the reasons Tacoma has to partner with so many different other agencies and organizations is because we don't have the financial resources to yeah. do it on our own, and that's been a real benefit, I think, because it does get buy-in from. Um, you know, multiple, multiple organizations. So yeah. you see projects going forward right. that have all these different entities involved, and that's, that's it's really impressive. Right. Um, on the flip side of that, where I see the, the challenge is how Tacoma relates to the county and how Tacoma relates to the regional, Puget Sound Regional Council. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a big disconnect because it, the, the, in part of its education, um, but a lot of the elected officials in the county don't really understand the, especially the growth policies of the regional council and are just wondering why, well, why can't I do this? And mm -hmm. it is, it, it, it's very apparent and that's where I see that collaborative, you know, uh, I wish Tacoma had a wall around it to keep, <laughs> to keep the uh, density in. Uh -huh. We actually have a floodgates opened up to let it all rush out um, into the county. So it's, it's trying to balance that, and I think that's the real challenge. But we also have, it's interesting, uh, Sound Transit 3s coming forward for the voters. And it's not meeting the same uh, chorus of approval that Sound Transit 2 did from the voters because of the regional um, aspect of people saying, well, where?" <laughs> We're going to get uh, to SeaTac by 2045, you know, right. um, and we really want to get there in a much easier way. But it'll be interesting to see how they attack that to try to get that collaboration. But yeah. thank you very much. It, I heard a lot of what you were saying. I had okay. experienced. Well, so that it made sense. So thank you. Gonna, I appreciate that, and I'm, I'm very interested in what you're describing because I should have mentioned. Maybe it's cheating, but um, because of this early um, desegregation struggle that put this wall around Denver. The city and the county are the same. So the city of the county is also the city of Denver is also the county of Denver, which solves some problems. <laughs> it creates some other ones. And we're also under what I think is a very, very, very severe uh, tax and expenditure limitation, the Tabor Amendment, which despite all of our growth, we can't capture it at the city level. There's a limit and we have to send back money. So this year they have to send back, they have to refund like $33 to me because there's too much money coming into the city and we can't keep it because of this Tabor Amendment that limits our ability to keep revenue above, above a certain limit. And I'll just mention, I told Ali I wouldn't go there, but you guys have also done the same thing. You've legalized marijuana and God, you know, it's a gold mine. It's just astounding. And, <laughs> you know, I've always, I think I've said so Ali before fun. that. I don't know if it's a gateway drug for teenagers, but it's definitely a gateway drug for mayors. <laughs> because once they have it, <laughs> they cannot stop. It's just incredible. And so the money coming in from marijuana is just remarkable. But because of the Tabor Amendment, we can't keep it. So the solution this year, and I'll just, just because I know you all are doing this too, you're maybe a couple years behind us. The solution this year was to have a tax-free day for marijuana. 
which doesn't seem to me like a hell of a solution, you know what I mean? <laughs> so we had all sorts of people coming in from Oklahoma. My nephew came down from Montana, you know, that no sales tax on any marijuana for like two or three days in a row because they needed to keep the revenue down. You know, they, they couldn't get the revenue above the taper limit. So, you know, the, the whole financial structure, we don't have, I think we're limited in number of resources, even though the state's booming. We can't keep it. We can't capture the wealth for the good of the people in the state. It has to go back. Okay, a little more time. <laughs> uh, so the conversation about the masterminds behind the scenes really resonates with me because our organization, the Ruckles House Center at UW and WSU, uh, does collaborative governance. We foster collaborative public policy, and I think both the work that my core faculty and staff do. Uh -huh. um, is that behind the, we say yeah. we're like the referee at the Super Bowl, you know, if yeah. you noticed us, <laughs> right. something's wrong. Right. Um, and, uh, but we also end up working with those masterminds, the Ken Salazars and Tom Clarks, right. in every, you know, every successful collaboration, right. we can tell you who the, who that unique, talented person or people were at those agencies that were able to think outside the box, that were able to build bridges and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I would, could talk for hours about that. But the other thing I wanted to mention, you've contrasted sort of the state-centric model yeah. with mm -hmm. the uh, civil society model. Yeah. And I was re recently speaking with someone, uh, he was a former chief of staff at EPA who's now at Vanderbilt, and he's looking at uh, climate. And he's using a term, as I was talking about collaborative governance, he was using a term he calls private climate governance. Um, and the, the, so the idea there is he doesn't see that any of the initiative to address climate issues in the United States are necessarily, he, he doesn't see them coming from the federal government anytime soon, doesn't even necessarily see them coming from a lot of state governments, but he's seeing, the biggest changes he's seeing are being driven by Microsoft and Walmart uh -huh. and other corporations who are saying, we're gonna do business this way. Right. If you want to do business with us, you must do it right. that way. And so he's really fascinated about what does it mean when there's a big shift in public policy that's being right. driven by private corporations. Right. Yeah, and what I, w what I will say about the collective impact framework, which you pointed out, is just in the air. And there's a study, Jeff Hennig at Columbia University did a study with within the last five years, a growing, there's just been a spike in the number of nonprofits using the collective impact language. Um, but to me, one of the reasons I think it's appealing, it doesn't sound political. You know, it doesn't sound like anybody's doing anything very political or polarizing, but it is ultimately hugely political because there's really have to be political savvy people doing what you're suggesting. It's connecting here and going up, going out, whatever. And they didn't have that at Piton Foundation because they were just used to working in this kind of civil society landscape. And they just, they're good and they're very, very strong, but they didn't have the political linkages to go up and to go out. And so in the end of the day, it's almost an apolitical kind of an argument. It's almost a normative argument. I, you weren't gonna go there, but I will. Um, it's almost a normative argument that we, government's not gonna do it. We've gotta do it ourselves. We don't have to involve politics. It doesn't have to be polarizing. It's so clear that children's well is being, everybody agrees, and this is what we need to do. I think it's probably romantic and maybe naive. So this is the reason I'm suggesting that, and then maybe they could have gone along if Piton had stayed in the game, but that's just one of the things they're dealing with. Piton didn't stay in the game and they didn't have anything else. They just weren't able or even occurring to them, imagining going up and going out in a way that was connecting with the political structure. Maybe I'm a political scientist and that's what it's all about. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I think we're up you. to the hour. It's a wonderful presentation and a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much.